Now, in any first aid situation, it's important to know what the patient's level of consciousness is. We sometimes abbreviate this to LOC, level of consciousness. And we can try and work this out by looking at the patient's level of response. How responsive are they? Now, of course, patients may be fully alert. And a very good judge of this is when you approach someone and if they look at you and you get good eye contact with them, the odds are that they are fully alert in that situation. So sometimes this assessment can just take a matter of seconds and then you can go on to think about other issues. But other times, of course, the situation is more complicated. So let's think why it's so important to see what the patient's level of response is as that is giving information about the patient's level of consciousness. Why do we need to know this? Well, one reason is it can give us information as to the cause of the reduced level of consciousness. And if we're able to identify what has caused the unconsciousness or the reduced level of consciousness, then we're able to instigate appropriate treatment measures because we can treat the cause specifically rather than treat the symptoms. So the reduced level of consciousness can be the symptom. But if we can identify the underlying cause and treat that, that, of course, is always better to treat causes rather than to treat symptoms. And also, if we can identify the cause of the unconsciousness or the reduced level of consciousness, this will give us some indication of possible prognosis. Now, prognosis means how things are going to evolve and unfold in the future. So if there's a good prognosis, the patient's level of consciousness will be increasing. If there's a poor prognosis, the patient's level of consciousness may be decreasing. And that brings us on to another important reason why it's important to assess the level of response and level of consciousness, because we can monitor a trend. So is this patient's level of consciousness improving? Are they getting better? Are they becoming more alert? Or conversely, is their level of consciousness dropping and they're becoming less alert, which of course would be very concerning because it could mean there's some underlying process which is progressively impairing the ability of the individual's brain to generate consciousness. So trends are always very important in any patient management situation. And another reason it's important to adjudicate the level of consciousness by looking at the patient's level of response is it will indicate the level of intervention that is required. So if the patient's conscious, it might just be a matter of sitting next to them, talking to them, giving them psychological support until professional help arrives. However, if the patient's level of consciousness is very low, then they're probably going to need full airway support to protect their airways. We'll have to be careful in case they vomit, which could cause aspiration and aspiration pneumonia. And if the level of consciousness is low, we'll probably have to use the recovery position to manage these patients while we're waiting for the professional help to arrive. So lots of reasons it's important to monitor level of consciousness and level of response. Now, consciousness is not an on off switch. In the previous video, we talked about the brain generating consciousness. And if there's compromise to the brain, for example, poor blood supply, poor oxygen supply, then the brain is unable to generate consciousness properly. But this is not an on off switch. So the brain can have what is called progressive levels of embarrassment. So the brain could have some glucose, but not enough glucose to generate full levels of consciousness. The brain could be under some external pressure, not enough to cause full unconsciousness, but enough to impede the functioning of the brain so that it can't generate full levels of consciousness. And it's this idea that gives rise to the idea of levels of response. And in the first aid situation, we want to learn the AVPU scale. And this stands for A-V-P-U, which is alert, voice, pain and unresponsive. So at the A level of response, the patient would be fully alert. They will be responding to us. We will be getting eye contact. We will be happy with the patient's level of consciousness, considering it to be basically normal. So the patient in that case would get an A. But if the patient's lying there with their eyes closed and we're not getting a spontaneous response, then they're not alert because the alert patient will give us a spontaneous response. That is the normal social interaction activity. But if the level of consciousness is slightly lower than that, then they will still respond to voice. 
So the casualty response to your voice. So when we speak to them, hello, how are you? Are you there? How are you feeling? We'll get some kind of response. That would be the V level of consciousness. But if the patient's not responding to us spontaneously, they're not an A. And if they're not responding when we talk to them or talk to them loudly, they're not a V. Then the next level of response on the APU scale, A, V, P, the P stands for pain. And here we'll get a response from the patient if we inflict some pain on them. Now, of course, we don't want to injure the patient, but we need to stimulate them in a way that gives some sort of response. And if they respond to pain, then they will be at the P on the APU scale level, which, of course, is a significantly lower level of consciousness than the A and it's also lower than the V level of response. And the final level on the Avpu scale, alert voice pain, U stands for unresponsive. And here the casualty is unresponsive. They are not responding to us at all. They're not responding spontaneously. They're not responding to voice. They're not responding to painful stimuli. They are unresponsive. They are fully unconscious. So they're the four main categories, A, V, P, U. But there are subcategories within these, really. There are gradations of these. So let's think about the A category. We've said the casualty is fully alert and we're getting icon. And these people should be fully responsive and they should be orientated to time, to place and to person. That means they know when they are, they should know roughly what time of day it is, what day of the week it is, what month of the year it is. So they should be alert to time. They should be alert to place. They should know where they are. So if you say, where are you? They could say, I'm in the park or I'm by the roadside or I'm in a pub or in a restaurant or whatever it is. And they should also be orientated to who people are around about them. So you can say, who's this person here? And they might say, this is my husband, this is my wife, this is my son, this is my daughter, this is my friend. So they'll be fully orientated to time, place and person. So someone at the higher level of the A category will be fully aware, fully orientated, give you a good eye response and be orientated to time, place and person. Someone at the lower level of the A, while they might be responding spontaneously, might be confused for time, place and person. And then going on to V, we can again categorise within the V classification. So if someone's responding to voice, they can respond to voice in a sensible way. What's happened to me? Who are you? They can be asking questions and then they'll answer questions. So if we say, are they diabetic? They might say, no, I'm not diabetic. So they can ask and answer questions, even though they might be a little bit confused in the voice category. But there again, when you speak to someone, they might respond with inappropriate words. So the casualty is able to speak words, but can't put them together into logical sentences. This would indicate a lower level of consciousness within the V classification. So we might get any appropriate words. So we might ask the casualty what their name is, and they might say something inappropriate like, I don't know, or some other word that has no real meaning and is not appropriate in the particular context. But still in the voice classification, if we speak to someone and they respond with sounds that aren't discernible as words, so we might get grunts or sighs or various non-verbal sounds from the person. So the casualty is not able to speak words, but can make noises. So again, we can see they're still responding to voice, but they're not responding to voice in organised sentences. They're not responding to voice in proper words, but they're just responding in nonverbal sounds. But they're just responding in sounds that do not constitute words. So again, we can see that someone could be at the higher level of the V category or at the lower level of the V category. Then moving on to P, where the casualty is not responding to voice, but will respond to pain. And again, there's two levels here, really. When we inflict a painful stimulus, so if I inflict a painful stimulus on your finger, for example, you should pull your hand away. You are localising to pain. So the response that the person makes to the pain that we are inflicting is localised to the appropriate part of the body. The casualty is able to localise to where the painful stimulus is applied. 
But if the level of consciousness is somewhat lower, even though the patient is in the P category, then they can respond to pain, but inappropriately. So for example, if we inflict pain on their left ear and they move their right foot or their right arm, they're still responding to the painful stimuli, but they're not responding to it in a way which is appropriate. They're not responding in a way that means they can reduce the pain or stop you inflicting the painful stimulus. So that would be a non-localized response to pain. Because always remember the normal response to a painful stimuli is to move away the part of the body where the pain is being experienced. And finally, if someone's not responding to pain, they are unresponsive. They are in the U category. And this is the lowest level of consciousness on the ABPU scale. And this means that the casualty is unresponsive to us shaking them, to us talking loudly to them, even shouting at them, and they're not responding to painful stimuli. The casualty is fully unconscious. And of course, in that situation, we'd have to instigate appropriate management of the unconscious patient. And I always think another test that's worth doing here is the eyelash reflex. So if you flick someone's eyelash with your finger without touching the skin of the eyelash, then it should flicker. If someone's consciousness, you'll get a flickering of the eyelid when you flick the eyelash. But if you flick someone's eyelashes with your finger and you don't get that reflex response of the eyelid, then again, that is a good indicator that someone is fully unconscious and would need to be managed appropriately to protect their airway so we can maintain airway and breathing. And while we're carrying out this activity, we can also gain additional information. There's always additional information if you think to look for it. So it's good to look at the environment. So to take an extreme example, if someone had just been pulled from a burning building and were unconscious, then it's reasonable to assume they've been inhaling smoke and carbon monoxide. And the cause of the unconsciousness could be carbon monoxide poisoning. Or if someone had been found at the bottom of a ladder or the bottom of a cliff, then there's a possibility that a fall is the cause of the low level of consciousness or the unconsciousness. And smell is also very important. So if someone smells of acetone, they may be ketotic because their diabetes is out of control. And of course, very commonly, people with low levels of consciousness can smell of alcohol because they've been drinking heavily. And if someone's drinking heavily, that's going to lower their level of consciousness. But what we must never do is assume that someone's low level of consciousness is caused by alcohol just because they smell of alcohol. So it's quite possible to smell of alcohol, but have a completely different cause for the reduced level of consciousness. And very often, even in professional medical situations, the fact that someone smells strongly of alcohol has reduced the thoroughness of the examination, which may have revealed other injuries, such as a head injury. So the actual true cause of the reduced level of consciousness might not be the alcohol, but it might be another injury or another cause. So you always have to look for another cause, even if the patient smells of alcohol. Now, perhaps nine times out of 10, the cause of the reduced level of consciousness will be the alcohol, but we must not assume that. It's interesting to check if the patient's been incontinent of urine or feces. So if the level of consciousness is very low, there can be incontinence of urine or feces. So for example, after epileptic fits, where patients are completely unconscious when there's been a seizure, then it's quite common if there was urine in the bladder, that this would leak out in urinary incontinence. Of course, we're always looking out for evidence of trauma, such as bleeding or bruising or abnormal positioning of limbs or parts of the body. Bear in mind that trauma could have occurred and we need to identify that. Always look at the color of your patient. For example, if there's pallor, then that could indicate that the patient is pale. Pallor means pale. And that can indicate that the superficial tissues are poorly perfused with blood. Now, of course, this can be harder in people with dark colored skins, but look at the fingernails, look at the lips, look at the center of the face. And you can often get good indicators to whether the patient has pallor and is, has got low levels of perfusion. And of course, we can always do a capillary refill test, gently squeezing the fingernails for five seconds and then letting go. And the pink color should return within two seconds. Has there been vomiting? Is there evidence of vomit? Is there staining? Is there evidence of bleeding? Does the patient feel hot? Does the patient feel cold? Is the patient pregnant? So in young women, always bear in mind the possibility of pregnancy. 
because we would not want to lie a pregnant person on their right side. We'd rather want to nurse them on their left side. And of course, we need to monitor the patient's level of breathing and circulation, as well as maintaining a clear airway. So that's the AVPU scale, reasons why the AVPU scale is important, additional information we can detect at the same time as we're carrying out this assessment, while attributing an A, V, P or U score to the patient's current level of consciousness, and hopefully saying whether they are high or low within the A, V, P or U category.